Matters. And then uh, so appropriate, that song, J.D. McPherson, uh, an album that just came out, I think it was just a few months ago. It might have been the tail end of last year. And uh, let the good times roll. It kind of leads us so nicely uh, into what we're going to talk about with uh, Derek Shelmerdine tonight. Um, Derek, as you know, is our musical historian. And we choose a subject every week, I beg your pardon, every month, a theme of some description. And uh, this week's theme is very, very early Beatles, pre-Ringo Beatles. And I don't quite know what Derek's going to say because um, I'm not the biggest Beatles fan. I'm not, I certainly don't know anything about the kind of very early Beatles stuff. But uh, no doubt uh, the guy sitting opposite me, uh, Mr. Derek Shelmerdine, will have, uh, have a good amount to say. Uh, Derek, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to Meridian once again. Thanks. It's absolutely great to be back. Good. Uh, we're talking about very early Beatles. Now, um, to most people, if you just say the Beatles, you've got this instant image of the mop, uh, top haircuts, you've got the, the, the suits, and you've got Ringo on the drums. But we're going back even before that, aren't we? We're going back to 1957. 57. I wasn't even born. <laughs> well, things were happening, even then. I mean, it, it's worth just uh, kicking off with uh, a, a second or two about the, uh, the background of the four guys. I mean, I'm just going to mention Ringo Starr because he does crop up when they were in uh, Hamburg. They did uh, meet and play together, which is probably one of the reasons why he ended up as the Beatles' ultimate drummer. But his name, uh, he, he, born Richard Starkey, and he got his the name Ringo from a, having a penchant for wearing uh, rings and having the name Starkey. And it was when he was in a band called Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. They had a gig of Butlins, and they all decided to... As they did at those times, the Beatles did this at one point as well. They all gave themselves nicknames. And then... Uh, John Lennon, Ringo's the oldest, then there was John Lennon, October the 9th, 1940. His mother and father parted company and he's brought up by his auntie, Mi uh, auntie uh, uh, Mimi in uh, Mendips, just round the corner from Strawberry Field that he chose as a, uh, a pretty strong title for a song later. And he was just getting back with his mother in, in his mid-teens and she was actually run over and killed by an off-duty policeman who was apparently the worst for wear. And Paul McCartney's father was... Uh, uh, a jazz pianist and trumpeter in the Jimmy Mack Jazz Band. And Paul originally learned piano and trumpet. But when the skiffle craze arrived, he decided that guitar was the way forward. And George came into the frame because, essentially, he was Paul's friend. John was a little bit uh, iffy about George joining the band because George is that a little bit younger. And when, when you're sort of 16, 15 and 14, there are very, very big differences in, in age. Hmm. But the whole band thing really started when uh, John Lennon and Pete Shotton, um, well, they actually put the Blackjacks together uh, initially, and they very quickly changed the name to uh, the Quarry Men after the school they were in. And the first real date of significance is the 6th of July, 1957, when there was a, a church fete in uh, Walton in uh, Liverpool, and John Lennon was playing there with his band, the, the Quarry Men. And a mutual friend, Ivan Vaughan, uh, brought uh, Paul McCartney along, and the reason um, Paul impressed John was that uh, he, he played 20 Flight Rock. Paul was a guitarist in those days. He played 20 Flight Rock, and John was impressed that he knew all the words to that, which I thought was um, quite nice. So John joined him, but when um, uh, Paul joined, but when John did his Cavern debut uh, a little later, uh, McCartney missed it because he was away at scout camp. <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> That's great. Because I'm just trying to, because you'd imagine in those days, you'd have probably worn the shorts and you'd have had the little woggle on and everything. You just Absolutely. Can't, can't imagine, Paul. How old would he have been then? Sort of 14, did you say 15? Yeah, he was born in 42, this is 57. So, right. yeah, okay. we're around the 15. Yeah. Uh, Mark. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I mean, that's the, I mean, we're not getting into this at all tonight, but you're absolutely right about the short trousers. This is the era when the teenagers were just, just starting. And at 15 years old, in that um, uh, day and age, you were just a little version of your dad. And what happened when you were 12, you went from short trousers to long trousers. Of course, because you were a little adult, and that was it. Because that was it, because you, the only person you had to look up to, your role model, was your father. Absolutely. You didn't have TV, you didn't, I mean, you had, you had the, you had the, the cinema. Uh, all the pictures, as we would have called it in those days. Um, but, uh, I mean, how many guys on there would have been? You'd have had James Dean, I guess, that kind of person. You'd have Absolutely. had Marlon Brando. Yeah. Um, but mainly, most of the films you'd have seen would have, again, been stereotypes of your dad in a nice suit, smart collar and tie, all that kind of thing, trilby hat. Absolutely. It was Rebel Without a Cause that really uh, was the start of the teenage as we know it and all the teenage angst that is very popular nowadays. And, I mean, George uh, came along. He joined the 
uh, the quarry men around uh, the, the beginning of 1958 and he'd had his own little band with his brother called the rebels and he, he was a, a guitarist and he was with uh, George uh, uh, Peter his uh, his brother and a, a friend called Arthur Kelly and when he um, was introduced to to John uh, as I say John really was not um, uh, he thought George was a little young but when he heard um, uh, George play uh, Bill Justice's raunchy, classic piece of uh, rock and roll instrumental music. Uh, he changed his mind, decided that uh, George was going to be a, a distinct addition to the um, to the family, as it were. Do, do we know what happened to Peter? Did he join no, any I, other boot, uh, I groups? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've never it, come it? across any uh, no, reference to him. Obviously, again. that was it, and he, once he'd yeah. finished it, yeah, that was gone. Yeah. I mean, th th this is a time uh, from the, the sort of late 50s, early 60s, where the, particularly in that part of the world, I mean, that's what I was from, and I did the same sort of thing when I was that sort of age. You know, you form a school band, and lots of people were uh, were in bands, but most people then, you know, went off and got proper jobs. You know, th there weren't too many people who became uh, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, sadly. But uh, things started to uh, come together for, well, it's still the Quarrymen. Uh, in the, uh, the middle of 1958, they had their first recording session uh, with a local guy who had a home recording session in Kensington um, on the outskirts of uh, Liverpool, a guy called Percy Phillips. And for the princely sum of 17 and 6, which for, for those who were not familiar with uh, old money, uh, was uh, just under a pound, uh, they had a, a recording session. They, they put put together uh, an acetate with um, uh, That'll Be The Day, Buddy Holly uh, song on one side, and In Spite Of All The Danger on the other, which is actually written by George and Paul, which was interesting, uh, with John as, uh, as a lead, uh, lead vocalist. And when I was just uh, looking um, at this, funny enough, a couple of days ago, I found a, a blue plaque that had been unveiled on the uh, on the building, and it was actually uh, unveiled by a guy called Billy Butler, who's uh, uh, an absolute legend. Uh, he's a DJ um, in this era. And if, if I just say, you just mentioned the book um, earlier. I'm pretty excited at the moment about all this. And it's as you know, it's the uh, the Cavern uh, launcher. The book launch is actually at the Cavern in Liverpool, and Billy Butler has said that he's coming along. So I'm quite excited about that. Um, I, I, wow, I can't wait to meet him. Yeah. Even right, though I've it, never heard of him. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, I mean, locally up there, you, you can see from here, he, he was a, a, an absolute legend from um, from that time. So he'd be, what, in his 70s now, I guess? He must be. Yeah, yeah he must be. Right, okay. Uh, Mid-70s, I should think. And then we're really coming towards the end of the incarnation with the uh, with the Quarrymen. And they, they had a guy called uh, Ken Brown on guitar, um, for a while and that was really the last the four of them john paul george and ken brown were really the last incarnation they never had a regular drummer or a regular bass player at this time so you so you you, you near enough had four guitarists did you Absolutely. Or, who, or who was playing bass no one was playing permanent bass then no they, they, they would have had other friends who um who played um bass i mean paul will come into that when paul actually uh takes up the bass because it, it's a very specific part of the of uh, the band, you know, it was a very distinct um, decision. But at that time, they, they were playing all kinds of covers, and you can imagine one of them, uh, one of the earliest they were playing from about 1957, um, was a Fats Domino song called Ain't It a Shame, uh, recorded by uh, Fats Domino in 1955, and a big, big hit for him. A landmark for him, in fact. Fats Domino, Ain't It a Shame. <laughs> Why did I play that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a quick one. It was indeed. On with the story. Let's try, let's try this one. Uh, for you, uh, <laughs> let's just get on with it. God, I'm rubbish at this job. <laughs> you made me cry when you said goodbye. Is that a shame? My tears fell like rain. My heart, when you see it, we'll part. Ain't that a shame? My tears fell like rain. Ain't that a shame? You're the one to blame. Oh, well, goodbye. Although I'll cry. Ain't that a shame? 
Domino, and uh, ain't that a shame? <laughs> great track. It was a great track, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. Um, so we're moving on a little bit now, then. Well, that's right. Uh, Ken Brown moved on. He was only with them very briefly. And they decided to change their name to Johnny and the Moon Dog. So it's now John, Paul, and George. And they did actually qualify for a, a talent contest, the Carol uh, Levis Search for a Star. They didn't win. It actually won by the Connaughts. But, you know, they, they, they were quite popular on the scene, even in those days. Um, but things really started to change when John Lennon uh, interview, introduced his um, uh, art college friend, Stuart Cuff Sutcliffe, to the other guys. And Sutcliffe was first and foremost a, a local artist, a qu quite um, uh, promising artist. And uh, he uh, was ex exhibiting at the John Moore's exhibition. He had a painting called The Summer Painting, a sort of abstract expressionism. And he sold it for £65, and Lennon persuaded him to buy a Hofner president. And so he financed his bass guitar. And he actually joined them, and I think it was um, um, Sutcliffe's suggestion. They changed their name to the Silver Beatles, and it's spelled with a double E at this point. Um, so now uh, they actually have a, uh, a bass guitarist. They're still um, going through drummers at a rate of knots. The, one of the... Um, first things that didn't go quite according to plan for the Beatles was on the 10th of May 1960, they failed an audition to become uh, Billy Fury's backing singer. Billy Fury was about to embark on a, a UK tour, and uh, the, the guy that was managing them, though he's often referred to as a booking agent rather than uh, a manager, was a guy called Alan Williams, and he organised uh, an, uh, an audition uh, to back Billy Fury, and this is now uh, John Paul George... Uh, Stuart Cl Sutcliffe and a guy called Tommy Moore on the drums but he was late for the audition and another band were auditioning that day Cass and the Casanovas, another well-known Liverpool band and their drummer Johnny Hutchinson stood in for the first half of the um, audition didn't actually help them because the, the Beatles didn't uh, actually get that particular gig though as a spin-off they did excuse me, <coughs> they did uh, then go on to back uh, Johnny Gentle uh, on a tour of um, Scotland, but Tommy Moore left at the end of that um, particular tour, and he was replaced briefly by a guy called Norman Chapman, and then the first real um, drummer came about with uh, Pete Best. Funny enough, he was actually from a group called the Blackjacks as well, which was a different Blackjacks, and spelt slightly um, differently, but one of life's um, great coincidences. And what happened was that um, Alan Williams now got them their first gig in Hamburg, and he told them that unless they get themselves a, a full-time drummer, you know, this was not going to uh, to happen. But just before uh, popping off to Hamburg, as it were, it's worth just mentioning the fact that uh, around this time, uh, the middle of June 1960, uh, John and Stuart Sutcliffe. Uh, in a band uh, calling themselves the Dissenters, actually backed um, a beat poet, a well-known uh, English beat poet called Royston Ellis, in a sort of fusion of music and poetry at the Jacaranda Club in Liverpool. And 
th- th- this was not an un- unknown thing because uh, I can't remember the date offhand, but a little bit later, about 61, I think, uh, Jimmy Page um, actually backed uh, Royston Ellis as well. Royston had seen him in uh, uh, a band at the time and invited him to um, back him at the, the Mermaid in a, uh, a poetry uh, reading. And three of the original shadows, Hank Marvin, Tony Meehan and Jet Harris, also backed uh, Royston Ellis. And if, if you look at that whole era, um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of overlap between the beat um, poets and the beat writers and uh, rock and roll. But off went the Beatles to um, Hamburg. And it, it's accredited to Royston Ellis that they and they'd, they'd now changed their name to the Beatles. They dropped the silver. They had called themselves all kinds of other things, but now they were the Beatles with an EA. And that's actually accredited to Royston um, Ellis, that they changed the double E to uh, the EA, as in beat, beat poets. And they headed off for uh, their initial gig at the, uh, the Indra Club. Um, and that opened on the uh, 17th of August, uh, 1960. And while they were there, they um, recorded uh, for the first time as what would become the, uh, the Mop Tops, the Fab Four, um, John, Paul, George and Ringo, uh, without um, Pete Best, um, played uh, uh, at a, a recording session. And they actually used, they just hadn't got a bass player, so the bass player was uh, Lou Wally Walters from uh, Ringo Starr's band, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And they recorded um, Summertime from Gershwin's uh, Porgy and Bess. There was quite a lot of that going on um, at that time as well, songs from the, uh, from the shows. But sadly, the, uh, the first trip to um, Hamburg had a fairly ignominious end. Um, the first uh, guy to uh, fall foul of the authorities was George. And he was deported for working under age. And apparently what had happened was that they'd started at the Indra Club and then they decamped to the Top Ten Club in Hamburg. And the owner of the Indra, Indra Club uh, took a dim view of this and reported George to the authorities and they slung him out. And uh, John, uh, sorry, Paul and uh, George uh, were the next to go. Um, when they reputedly um, set fire to um, the inside of a derelict um, cinema. Apparently not too much damage was caused, um, but they were given their marching orders from Germany as well. Uh, John was the only one to actually make it back to um, to Liverpool under his own steam, uh, because uh, Stuart Sutcliffe decided to um, stay on. He uh, formed a relationship with a local uh, photographer lady called Astrid Kirscher, and he decided that um, he would uh, he would stay in Hamburg, so he stayed there. The other guys went back to Liverpool. And what's important about this era, really, is it was Astrid Kirscher had a big, big impression on the Beatles' um, image at that time. Um, the uh, the hairstyles come from uh, people that they, she was involved and, with, and she did take a lot of their photographs early. Absolutely, those early photographs. Didn't yeah, she? there are yeah. some classic photographs of them sitting around in the leather jackets. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking for all the world like uh, Gene Vincent lookalikes, and a lot of their image at that time was very much uh, the Gene Vincent uh, look, which coincidentally takes us into Bee Bop Well, Bee Bop she's my baby. Bee Bop I don't mean my baby. Bee Bop she's my baby. Bee Bop Well, she's the gal in the red blue jeans. She's the queen of all the teams. She's the woman that I know. She's the woman that loves me so. Say, be bopalula, she's my baby. Be bopalula, I don't make my baby. Be bop up she my baby, 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 
Gene Vincent, of course, and uh, Bebop Alula. Um, now we're moving on a bit, and Paul has moved over to the base, I see. That's right. Well, what happened was they came back to Liverpool. Of course, they had some gigs, and Stuart Sutcliffe had stayed over with um, uh, his girlfriend in um, Germany. So it, uh, there was a little bit of discussion as to who should take the base, and the, um, Paul really stepped up to the, um, the mark. Because um, um, out of the four of them, he's the musician, isn't he? If you see what I mean, he, he can just play anything, and, and yeah. he's just brilliant at everything, isn't yeah. he? Apparently, uh, in the early days, the very uh, going back now again, uh, when it was him and John, he was the lead guitarist. But apparently, he froze. Um, I forget which song it was. Now he was well, solo. He was actually playing, um, so he sort of always shied away. So he was. That's probably why he introduced George in the uh, in the first place. That, but he is the one. I mean, his first album, he played just about every instrument yeah. um, on the yeah. album. Yeah. Very talented. Yeah, okay, I must yeah. say, when I was writing the book, um, he, I, I was always, at the time, I was more of a John Lennon fan. Um, but uh, when I really started to research into it, I mean, Paul McCartney just kept going up and up and up, in my estimation. I mean, after Pepper, it was really uh, McCartney that drove the Beatles and really kept them together and kept them um, moving forward, I think, to a, to a great extent. He's a mm. great talent. Oh, amazing. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And in 1999, he played on the same stage that we're going to be playing on next Wednesday, he adds, <laughs> with a wry grin. <laughs> Do you think he signed his name in the dressing room wall or oh, something? Oh, let's hope so. We can hope so, can't we? <laughs> yeah, so, so now he took on. He, they did... Um, well, what happened was, just before he took over, um, because they had some gigs, uh, a guy called Chaz Newby, who was the bass player with uh, Pete Best's uh, Blackjacks, um, stepped in, but he was just home from college. So he went back, and that was when Paul uh, took it over. And they did their first uh, cavern appearance as the Beatles then in 61, uh, February the 9th, just to let you know how things are sort of rolling forward here. And that was George, George's um, cavern debut. And then they went back to, uh, to Hamburg in the summer, or early summer, uh, back to the uh, Top Ten Club. And that's where they recorded, the, they made their famous recording of um, My Bonnie, uh, they were they were very friendly with um, another British group, uh, Tony Sheridan, uh, and he was Tony Sheridan was actually the first uh, English band. Tony Sheridan and the Jets were the first English band to actually go out and play in um, Hamburg, and they got together. Why, uh, why why did they choose Hamburg? I mean, why why did they go over to New York or Paris? You know, what was so special about Hamburg? I don't know, know to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean it. The, Germany's always uh, been a, a big, um, I guess a big mark. Well, it's a big mark. But the answer is probably that Germany uh, in in Europe is is one of the biggest uh, rock markets. I I so it, they they would have probably had um, a lot of interest in the R and B stuff that was and was happening. Also, there. of course, at the time, you would have found a lot of um, British and Americans there because of obviously because the, the political war. situation. Yeah. And uh, lots of uh, you know army so, uh, army people based there, aren't they? So I guess it, it right. just yeah, I guess so it's a combination of yeah. um, stuff like that. But it, it certainly was a breeding ground. I mean, it, it, all, all the bands at that time went out to um, um, to Hamburg and and played there. But it's very hard life. They play for hours and hours and hours. Um, sleep above the club if they were if they were lucky. But they recorded um, a couple of songs, uh, "My Bonnie" and "The Saints." Um, but they just, they, it was released in Germany originally on Polydor as uh, Tony Sheridan and the um, Beat Brothers. 
um, because they felt uh, Beatles sounded a little too much like um, Peedles, which was um, slang for a sort of male appendage. Um, so it was released as the Beat Brothers, which was uh, interesting um, in the fact that uh, later when people went looking for uh, for the record, they, um, they were asking for the Beatles, but um, it didn't actually exist in that form. That's to come shortly. They also recorded a couple of things without uh, Tony Sheridan, H.G. Sweden, Cry for a, a Shadow. Uh, again, written by George and John. So it, it's interesting that in the very early days, you know, Paul and John hadn't hooked up together. Um, and uh, George was uh, very much part of the, the writing team. And that single, or th those recordings, were reco uh, recorded, pr uh, produced by Bert uh, Kempfert, who uh, did uh, a lot of work, mo more in the uh, middle of the road um, area. Those those recordings all exist, and in fact um, were released um, as singles in America and all over the place. But th it was around this time that the uh, the iconic Beatles hairstyle um, came into uh, into the fore. Uh, at at the time, um, the crowd that Astrid Kirscher was hanging around with, called the Exes, after her name was said, existentialism after the, uh, the, the the views that they they took and for John's 21st he and Paul decided they'd hitchhike to Spain but they never got any further than uh, Paris and they met uh, one of their chums there from um, for Hamburg days uh, Jürgen Vollmer and he, he and the exes all wore their hair in that beetle fringe and it, it, he they persuaded John and Paul persuaded him to um, sort of style their hair in the same way and it was one of the reasons that later that um, it was suggested that Pete Best maybe wasn't so popular. Was he, he, if you look at the photographs from that era, he was the only one that didn't wear his hair um, sort of forward. So the, the Beatles hairstyle arrived. Just branching from the Beatles very slightly, possibly the first ever world supergroup came when Jerry and the Pacemakers, another very well-known Liverpool band, combined with the Beatles for one night only to form the, uh, the Beatmakers at Litherland Town Hall with a guest performance from um, another band that was there, uh, Carl Terry, um, as uh, one of the, the vocalists. Sadly, it was never recorded. I mean, that would be quite an interesting thing to have heard nowadays. But that really brings us to the um, Brian Epstein. It was uh, Brian ran a, a record shop in Liverpool at that time, and very famously. Um, a guy called Raymond Jones supposedly walked into the shop and asked him if he had a copy of My Bonnie by the Beatles. And of course, Brian Epstein couldn't find it because that particular recording was only released in Germany and was released as uh, the Beat Brothers. Um, I think Brian Epstein's book actually says that this happened, but I've seen other reports that suggest that it might be just a little bit apocryphal, that story. But I think it's a lovely story and I think that we should, we should stay with the, um, the happy version of it. But Brian was, um, apparently several people uh, were talking to him about this, and uh, Brian decided he'd go down to visit the cabin and see the Beatles. And he saw them for the first time at the back end of um, 1961. And if you see any photographs of him at the time, he, he is uh, resplendent in a pinstripe suit and looking slightly out of place standing in the, um, uh, the teenage world of the, um, the cabin. But it was then, then around the December, that I think he, he, signed, he signed the Beatles up initially in, a, in an almost informal um, manner. Um, and then, again, it, it, now we, we're all, it, this is all the end of 1961. Uh, the Beatles did their, it wasn't, wasn't until December the 9th, 1961, the Beatles did their first gig in the um, south of England. And it was in Aldershot. And the local um, promoter, when I say he promoted it as the Battle of the Bands, uh, it, the poster suggested it was the Battle of the Bands, and it was the Beatles uh, versus Ivor J and the Jaywalkers, but he hadn't really promoted it too well, and reputedly only 18 people turned up. I've seen a photograph of that, and there were a handful of people in a very mm. empty dance hall. But what's interesting about that trip, apart from the fact that it was the first visit itself, was that after the gig in Aldershot, they decided they'd go uh, into Soho and uh, visit their old mate Brian Casser, who was the Brian Casser of Cass and the Casanovas, uh, who back in the Billy Fury 
a failed audition. It was the, their drummer that stood in for them. Now, Brian Kasser, at the end of um, Kastner Casanova's, he decided he'd uh, move down to London from Liverpool. The other guys did, called themselves the Big Three and became on the best live acts that Liverpool ever had in that era. I saw them a few times. Absolutely amazing. Um, but Brian Kastner also, back in about 57, had formed a skiffle group with um, Bill Wyman. It, it, it's amazing how... Um, various people pop up all over the place. But Brian Cass is even more interesting because he went on to form a group called Casey Jones and the Engineers, uh, which was um, Eric Clapton's second group. What a great name for a band. <laughs> oh, absolutely brilliant. Brilliant name. But around September 63, Clapton did reputed seven or eight um, gigs with them and decided they were far too uh, pop-oriented for him and went off and joined the, uh, the Yardbirds. So Brian Kasser has quite a, uh, a star-studded um, past. We're kind of getting a bit close yeah. to the time now, Derek. So yeah. uh, I'd like to, I'd like, I don't want to miss any of this out. So we're, what, they, they now move on to their, yeah, they failed their, their, their famous audition. Decker audition, which yeah. they obviously failed. Absolutely failed it. Um, they did 15, they did, and for long they did 15 uh, songs, three of which were originals. Mm. And in fact, one of the songs that they did cover was um, Barrett Strong. Uh, money. Yeah. I'll tell you what we do. We're, we're going to let Barrett Strong play away, but you carry on talking, Derek. Okay. Because, I mean, everybody knows this by the Beatles. I don't know how many people know it by Barrett Strong. Not many. Not many at all. Yeah. This, I mean, this is the absolute uh, original version. Yeah. But what happened then was the, um, uh, the uh, UK release uh, of My Bonnie um, happened, and they... Uh, released it again as the uh, as the uh, Beat Brothers in uh, America. So they had the first single released in America in 1962, long before uh, Love Me Do happened. But sadly, uh, Stuart Sutcliffe died um, around this time for brain hemorrhage. He was just 21 years old. Uh, I seem to recall that they were just um, entering Hamburg for one of their uh, visits when they, they heard the, loot, the news. And... The, that brings us to the uh, famous uh, Love Me Do recording sessions. At, uh, the, the first one they did was actually with uh, Pete Best. And they recorded uh, Bessamucho as well. But George Martin decided that um, Pete Best wasn't, uh, wasn't really the drummer for the band. Um, and when Ringo Starr came in, uh, because... Uh, uh, George Martin didn't really like uh, Ringo that much either and the third uh, recording of Love Me Do was actually with a session musician Andy White mm. and one of the ways you can tell which one you're listening to because all, all three have been released Pete Best was only ever released on Anthology 1 but the other two pop up all over the place um, you can tell which one's which because if there's a tambourine it's Ringo playing the um, tambourine but just one of the very quick analogy which is interesting is or parallel uh, the who had the same thing um their drummer doug sandham had been with them for for two years they did their first recording session and that producer decided he wasn't the one for the job either yeah. and that's why keith moon joined the um the oh, who. so these things are, are there all the time and again funny enough johnny hutchinson was the guy that stepped in for about three gigs between pete best leaving and uh ringo joining but Ringo was the only one of the Beatles who came from a different direction. Yeah. I mean, he, he was with um, Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group, Darktown Skiffle Group, and then the Raving Texans that actually became the uh, became Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And his first official gig, so the Mop Tops Fab Four started on August the 18th, 1962. Amazing. Yeah. All that, and over what period was that? How many? How long well, was that? From 50, 57 till 62? It's five years. Yeah. I mean, now it's overnight success via the TV. And that, but that's the thing. I mean, we, I, I mean, you've seen the, uh, you must have seen the um, the Beatles uh, film, um, the one where Stuart Sutcliffe is actually in it, and they yeah. talk about his, girl, uh, his girlfriend Astrid, etc., yeah. etc., and the one where he dies and all that. Lot. That's obviously all the early years. I can't remember what it's called. Can you remember what it's called, that film? Backbeat. Ah, oh, right, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's the only thing. But everybody just thinks of the Beatles as in the main, yeah. you know, mid, mid, to late, mid to late 60s, don't they? Yeah. yeah. But it's a fascinating tale, isn't it? 
Well, I, I think so. But it, 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 it just carried on over such a long period. They carried on. They kept having um, different people. But slowly but surely, you know, it's interesting to see how, you know, they, they were short of a bass player because of. So Paul became a, a very significant um, bass player. Yeah. Um, and then at the, at the end of the story, the drummer didn't work out after two years of live performance. So they had a new drummer. And I, the Beatles I, were born. I guess there's, I know there's probably been dozens and dozens of books written about the Beatles, but uh, I'm sure that uh, after looking at your Rock and Roll Unraveled, you could, if you wanted to spend the next seven years, you could probably do the same on the Beatles, just covering those five years, couldn't you? Without a doubt. You know, Absolutely. So much doubt. happening, so much yeah. happening. Uh, Derek, as usual, uh, it's been uh, a real fascinating eye opener. Um, perhaps we could do the same with the Stones. I don't know if the Stones pre. Um, yeah, the old days is where Alexis Corner and yeah. all the Stones have got a really good backstory as well. Oh, well, perhaps we'll do one of those one day, but uh, uh, for now we'll, we'll think of something else to do between now and uh, the end of June when Absolutely. we'll come back in with something else. Perhaps we do something the complete opposite. Exactly. We'll think of something, though. But uh, uh, for now, Derek, thanks very much for coming in. Uh, My pleasure. Say, as usual, been uh, an absolute hoot. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, just, uh, well, we'll play Love Me Do. Uh, Derek, thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Fantastic track, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. Uh, and apparently, uh, not Ringo on the drums there. Andy White there on the uh, on the drums, the old session musician. Uh, brilliant stuff. I mean, some people do knock the Beatles. I'm not quite sure why, because I just, you know, their their skill is just phenomenal. Uh, some people don't like it. I mean, perhaps because they, perhaps because they've just became so successful. And a lot of people don't like success, do they? But uh, uh, some of the songs they wrote were just magnificent. Uh, I do remember, I can't remember which DJ actually said it, but he was interviewing Paul McCartney. And uh, Paul McCartney walked out of the room and he said, there goes Mozart. Uh, you know, he just thought that, that you, you just put them on the same sort of level uh, as, as each other. You know, in a different era, producing different music, but the skill and the quality is there. And Paul McCartney's still doing it. The voice has gone a bit, but uh, he's still doing it. He's still an absolute genius musically, without a doubt. Uh, some of the stuff he writes, just fantastic. Uh, the Beatles, of course, and uh, Love Me Do. Uh, this is me, Dave Roberts, on the fantastic Meridian 107 FM. We've got a couple of minutes to nine, and uh, just.